One of the blocks that's very useful and often used in many, many applications is the phase lock loop, or PLL for short. Now, PLL can be subject of a full course. A discussion of PLL can be an entire course dedicated to it. So we are going to give you a very, very brief introduction to some of the basic concepts of PLL in a short period of time. And of course, you can go and study on your own. So what is the PLL? The PLL is a feedback loop that actually takes an oscillator and it locks the output of the oscillator either through a divider or without a divider to a reference input. So you can have this a, some sort of an oscillation, some sort of a frequency coming in. You can actually lock an oscillator, another oscillator, a VCO, to that. And the way the locking happens is that, imagine for a second that this divider is not here. The output of the VCO is going to be done, goes through a phase detector, and the phase of the output is compared with the phase of the input signal. And that difference produces a error signal that through some sort of a filtering signal is applied back to the VCO. So it's a feedback loop that tries to correct, tries to increase. So if you see that the phase is lagging, it's, the voltage is going to be built up at the input of the VCO, and then pushes the frequency up. And if you see that the phase is leading, then the negative, the, the, there would be a negative in net signal applied to it. So basically, it will try to bring it down. And it will adjust the voltage of the VCO, the control voltage of the VCO, in such a way that the output frequency has a known phase relationship, a fixed known phase relationship determined by the phase detector to the input signal. Now, if you take that block and add a frequency divider right, in the feedback path, what can you expect? You can expect the inputs of the phase detector still to be in phase. So the two inputs should also be at the same frequency. If two things are phase locked, they have to be at the same frequency, right? Now, what that means in terms of the output? So the output has to be at n times the frequency, so after division, it gets to the right frequency. So you can see that this is basically takes a, a, an input signal and multiplies it up by a factor of n. So it becomes a frequency multiplier. And this is another, yet another example of functions that appear in the feedback path getting inverted. Remember we talked about this? So this is another example. You have a frequency division in the feedback path so that the closed loop system operates as a frequency multiplier. Now, what are the applications for PLLs? One is frequency synthesis. You are generating a high frequency off of a low frequency reference. Let's say you have a very precise reference that you, let's say you have a 100 megahertz reference, or like a 1 megahertz reference, right? That's generated off of a very precise, let's say, I don't know, crisp coarse crystal or some other source. And you're trying to make replicas that are exactly time locked to this thing. How would you do that? You basically can use one of these PLLs and generate those high frequencies. Not only that, you can actually change the output frequency by changing the division ratio. So you can synthesize different frequencies by controlling that frequency division ratio. So if I change this n, as a result, I produce a different output. So let's say my input was at 1 megahertz, and my n was 1,000. Right? So I'm producing a 1 gigahertz output. Now, if I change n to 1,001, then I'm producing a 1.001 gigahertz signal. And there are also ways to actually even do things in between them. We call them fractional. So you can basically switch between the two division ratios at a given rate and kind of interpolate between them and produce a signal that's on average the output. And if the loop response is slow enough, that, that switching will not appear at the output. You can make it appear small. The other thing that it's often used is clock recovery. When you have digital data coming in, and your digital data is basically, you don't want to send a separate line for digital clock for sampling. it. You can actually use the PLL to recover the clock itself from the random data that's arriving. So that's clock and data recovery systems. And there, it's used for a lot of things, for clock distribution network, timing control, things of that sort. So, so this is the basic block diagram of the P, uh, PLL, right? You have a phase detector. You have a, a, a loop filter in general that has some sort of a transfer function. You have a voltage-controlled oscillator, which we talked about briefly. And then you have a frequency divider. So how about the phase domain modeling of this thing? So if you think about it, there are really two domains in, in, the, VC, uh, in the PLL. If you look at, look at the PLL original block diagram, you will see that at the input here, you're talking about two different frequencies. And what really matters is the relative phases of these two frequencies. Now, once you get to the output of the phase detector, you are producing some sort of a current or voltage. So here in the middle, you're dealing with the currents and voltages. And then at the output, again, you're transferring these currents and voltages back to a frequency. Now, the other interesting thing about the phase lock loop is that 
if you look at the original block diagram, the stuff that's in red are only high frequency part of it, if you have a large division ratio. Which makes this part, the black part, low frequency, lower frequency relative to the high frequency part. So as long as you can make this, that part in high frequency, the rest of it can actually operate at lower frequency. Now going back to this model, so you can actually develop a model in the phase domain. So instead of, so capital phi of S is the frequency domain representation of the phi of T, the phase in time, if you look at the frequency domain. And when you look at it, the PLL can be represented like this. So what you can think about is that the phase detector is really a difference, difference between, it's just a, a subtraction of the input phase and the return phase that produces the error phase. And that goes through some, what we call the gain of the phase detector, which has units of voltage or currents divided by radians, or by input phase difference. So it converts the phase difference to a voltage or a current, and that goes through some sort of a filter represented in H of S, and then goes through the VCO. Now, the VCO is represented as another parameter, KV, the VCO gain, divided by S. Why divided by S? Well, it's basically, what is it? What is the something that produces 1 over S in frequency domain? It's an ideal integrator, exactly, right? So why is the VCO an ideal integrator as far as the phase is concerned? There are different ways to see this. But the simplest way is that the impulse response model that we had for VCO. What was the impulse response of the VCO or, or an oscillator when we th thought about the input current or voltage versus output phase? You saw that this impulse response was a step, right? What, blocked, what, what, what system has an impulse response that's a step? An ideal integrator, right? Well, we saw that, yes, exactly. And then what we also saw that it was a time varying integrator, but nonetheless, it's an integrator. So that's why you are representing it as an integrator, right? So, and then you have your divider. You have the frequency divider. So what is the response of a frequency divider in phase domain? If you look at the argument of a cosine of omega naught t, when you're dividing it, you're also dividing the phase. Just your, it's a scalar division now. So then it becomes a scalar 1 over n. So in phase domain, it reduces to this linear system. I mean, if you ignore the nonlinearity, there's nonlinearities in the system, but you can reduce it to that. And for an arbitrary loop of nth order, the transfer function is given, given by this. I mean, you can easily calculate it from just basically writing the feedback equation for this. And from that calculation, you will see that it is basically n times k, where k is the product of the gain of the phase detector and the phase of the VC, gain of the VCO, times h of s divided by k h of s plus n times s. Now, so the loop dynamics, you can see that you can actually change the dynamics of this loop, the transfer function of this loop, by controlling H of S. So by, but, but depending on what kind of filter you put in this loop, you can actually control its overall closed loop dynamics from the input to the output. Now, how are these blocks implemented? So this is a, a typical example of a very standard way of doing this. The phase detector is implemented, for example, can be implemented as what we call a uh, phase, detector, phase frequency detector and a charge pump. So, so this is the combination of the phase detector and the loop filter. The phase detector is basically, this is a basic combinatorial logic system that looks at these two references, and if reference is leading the VCO, for example, then it produces these up pulses and no down pulses. So what that means is that basically there will be more current injected into this loop filter, and the voltage starts going up. Now, likewise, if the order is reversed, so if now, if your VCO is leading your reference, then you, it will generate down pulses, which basically means that you start, start pulling current out of this capacitor. And as a result, I start lowering the voltage. Now, if you combine these things, you can easily see that the Kp times H of S overall in aggregate for this thing would be that, that this current, Ip, divided by Cp, this capacitance, and then through introduction of this resistor here, Rz, we can introduce a zero in the transfer function. We've done this before. One of the ways of introducing zero was a parallel, was, was a shunt Rc in series, right? So when you, once you introduce a resistor in series with that capacitor, you can actually introduce a zero that actually is useful in compensating the loop and adjusting its property. So, and this tau z is one over Rz Cp. So this is the transfer, uh, this is the, the, you can basically get the transfer function of this charge pump and uh, you know, phase detector and loop filter equivalent. Uh, so what does this zero do? If you look at that zero that we introduced and write the transfer function, you can actually write the transfer function in this form. If you introduce this zero that we talked about, 
um, you will see that your transfer function gets modified in this following form. So the output to input phase transfer function is, has that zero in the numerator. And then in the denominator, also, you will get a second order response that has a tau z in it. And this leads to what we call sometimes the jitter peaking. So at the tau z frequency, what happens is that as you would expect with a zero, with the left half plane zero, the amplitude response starts going up before the poles come in and push it down. And you will get basically more phase noise. Your transfer function actually peaks here instead of going down. It increases it. It's, this is the typical thing in, that can happen also in feedback loops, right? So in a feedback loop, you can actually have a situation where you increase it around the transition time. So how do we model these things? We can think about a behavior model. We saw that the VCO has a 1 over f squared and 1 over f cubed region and a flat region in its phase noise response. So how do we model that? We know that also that VCO can be modeled as an ideal integrator. So we can produce the effect of the 1 over f squared noise by feeding white noise into the input of the VCO. If you feed the white noise into the input of the control voltage of the VCO, since it acts as an ideal integrator, it would produce the 1 over f squared noise, right? Because integration is 1 over s, but you're looking at the power, so you're looking at 1 over j omega magnitude squared. So basically, just like you get 1 over omega squared. And if you feed it with 1 over f noise, then you will get 1 over f cubed noise. But however, you have to be careful that that, that behavioral model at the input includes a corner frequency that corresponds to the 1 over f cubed corner of the VCO, not the 1 over f noise of the oscillator itself. So if you feed, the input, uh, feed this response with a 1 over f squared noise, 1 over f noise, and the flat noise to the input of the VCO, you can behaviorally model it as a noiseless VCO so if you have a noisy VCO, you can think about it as a noiseless VCO with this noise being added to the, its input control voltage. So this is a behavioral model. And of course, you have the flat noise, to, to flat white noise floor and they, that you can also model as, again, this being a noiseless VCO and, and out the noise, that black SN1 noise injected into the output. So if you take all, th all of these things and combine them in aggregate, what you see, you will get the power spectral density at the output that has a 1 over f squared behavior, has a 1 over f cubed behavior, which has a quarter of 1 over f, omega 1 over f, and then it has a flat noise behavior. So you can see these three terms on the right-hand side, the 1 omega 1 over f cubed uh, over omega and n over 2 that produce the 1 over f cubed, 1 over f squared, and flat regions of the noise. Um, how about the divider? What does the divider do to the noise and the properties of the system? So if you have a frequency divider, if you, your input is cosine of omega t plus phi of t plus n of t, then the argument of the divider gets divided by factor capital N, right? If you divide by n, the arguments gets divided. Therefore, if you have an input phase noise, you would expect the output phase noise to be about to be 20, dB, 20 log of n lower, which would be basically a division by n. Right? That's the power of the output versus the power of the input. However, the divider can add its own added noise. So its floor you do, at some point may be different from the floor that you expected from the input. So it may present a higher floor. So when, once you hit the floor, the, this difference can be different. It can be actually even above the floor. Of what, depending on what, the, what is inside of it, it's just basically the added noise, white noise that the system adds. So, Frequency dividers can be done, usually are done, especially if you have large division ratios, some, uh, are done in stages. So you divide by something, by some, and, and, and then take the output and divide it up by something else. So a lot of times you just go into stages of division. Now, if you do a stages of division, each one of them adds its own additive noise to the system, which becomes the input to the next stage, right? So it can aggregate a lot. Are we stuck with this? In fact, no, there is a, an, <laughs> interesting and old technique, uh, which I actually found this in the earliest reference to this, is one of the old translated stuff from the old USSR. Um, somebody named Levovich uh, did this. And it's basic and has been rediscovered since several times. Um, but the idea here is that if you have a whole bunch of dividers, and if, if you let these deviations add up, it can aggregate and become large. But one of the things you could do you don't have to do it, but you can do it, is that at the very end, retime it. In other words, take the original cl the clean clock, the cleaner clock at its input, and use this to trigger and clock it. So if it's deviating from its ideal position, which is what you expect, as you go through the division, division 
the, the edges become less and less accurate because there's more and more noise added. But at the last stage, if you add another flip-flop, and you, when it comes in, no matter when it comes in, you re realign it with the original clock at the input, then a lot of that can be taken out. Now, this is not exactly free, because then you will go back. You remember we said that these are at higher frequencies, because as you divide down, you go to lower and lower frequencies. But this thing is now being clocked at the full rate. In the example I gave with the one gigahertz and one megahertz reference, this is going to be now clocking at one gigahertz. So it can have implications in terms of power consumption, et cetera, et cetera. But if you are trying to get rid of that noise, you can always do that by retiming the clock at the end of the chain. So, so let's take all of these blocks that we've, we've made and put them together and look at the general behavior of the oscillator, so, of, of a PLL. So we are going to do, we're going to make bits and pieces and then take these bits and pieces to combine them together. So we are going to first do two, two different scenarios. First is we are going to do a noiseless input. So the reference coming in, we're assuming is perfect, it's noiseless. The only source of noise in this system, let's assume that's the VCO. Right? So if we assume that the only source of noise in the system is the VCO, we want to see what the, what the loop does. And let's start with the first order loop, where basically the transfer function is simply a first order transfer function to feed out uh, from the input noise to the output. So you have a first order response here. What the other thing we will do is that we are going to do a parallel t frequency and time domain development. Of this. So this is the frequency domain picture of the phase noise of the, of the PLL. So here what you see is the following. You see that actually if you had the loop, if, you, if the loop was not there, if you had an open loop VCO, and if you had only the white noise at the input, of course you get one of F squared noise because that gets integrated. That's basically what you get out of white noise. So you will get this black curve if you look at the phase noise, the spectrum of the phase at the output, right? You get see basically this black curve. It drops at rate of 20 dBs per de negative 20 dBs per decade, and it goes down. Now, if you actually put a PLL, if you close the loop, what you will see that for this, from this, the, the transfer function from this input noise to the output is written by first order low pass, can be determined to be first order low pass. And what that means is that the noise of the PLL is flat up to a point and then it goes down. So what is happening? If you think about it, it's, it there's an omega loop which is the bandwidth of this loop, the, the bandwidth of this transfer function. It means that when things, remember, things on the left side of this graph are things that are moving slowly, slowly varying things, right? This is slowly varying deviations. So the loop makes corrections to the slowly varying things. If it sees that it's deviating from the ideal reference, the loop has enough bandwidth, enough speed to correct for that, right? But now, things that are on the right-hand side of this plot are things that are happening fluctuating fast. And if they're happening faster than the bandwidth of the loop, the loop cannot react fast enough to them. So it's oblivious to them. So it's as if the loop is not there. So the system acts like an open loop VCO. So you see what you got from the open loop VCO. And the transition happens at omega loop. And this is exactly what's given by this expression that you will find analytically. So it means that the loop will make corrections. The first order loop will make corrections and reduce the noise, the phase noise, for slowly varying parts, ones that correspond to small offsets. But for fast varying ones, it doesn't do anything. Now, if you go to a time domain picture, you remember we had, we said that the, j the jitter basically grows with time. Um, so if you look at it, then, then there were potentially two different slopes. So we had the uncorrelated part and the correlated part. And if you have the uncorrelated part, you have the slope of uh, 0.5, and you have the correlated part, you have slope of 1. So if you, let's say you have this. If you have an open loop VCO, let's just assume that you have a slope of 0.5 only. It will, grow without, it, it will grow without downs, right? The longer you wait from your triggering edge, the more fluctuation, more deviation, more fuzziness you will have with your transition edges. But now, as you increase the loop, now, if you have a closed loop system, you will see that you can actually show analytically in this case. You can actually derive it from the uh, wiener kinchin theorem. You can just basically take that spectrum and put it in there and get the time domain deviation. So you can see that actually, once you get past the time constant of the loop, it will make corrections. So this flattening, this correction that you see here, corresponds to the correction that you saw for low variations, which basically here corresponds to long times. Left-hand side is fast varying things because it's shorter times, right? You can see that the loop doesn't do anything for fast varying times. It's, it's the time domain picture of what we saw in frequency domain in the previous picture, right? 
So it basically just gives you, it behaves the same as, for fast varying things, it behaves as a, the same as a, an open loop VCL. But as you go to things that take longer and longer, as the, now the loop, once you go beyond the time constant of the loop, the loop reaction, the loop can kick in and make corrections. And you can see that it doesn't let it grow without bounds, and it basically makes it flat in the presence of a, a perfect noiseless reference. So that's what this, the scenario number one we are talking about, right? The noiseless reference, when we have no noise in your reference. So the second scenario we're going to talk about is the noiseless VCO. So now let's assume that all of your noise is coming from your reference. Your reference is noisy, but your VCO is perfect. You have the, the ideal VCO. It's noiseless VCO. Now we want to see what happens to the frequency the, or, or phase noise of the input no, reference that you use, and how does it get evolved when it goes through the loop. So when you have a noiseless VCO, for example, um, again, in the, in, in the absence of the loop, the phase noise, basically, this is the input, the phase noise of the input, right? Now, what you will see is that if you had no division, the division ratio is one, you can easily show, again, for this kind of behavior, that the loop, in fact, will track the noise of the input within its loop bandwidth, which makes sense, right? It's a feedback loop. It's trying to track the, force the output to track the input. When the output, when the input fluctuations are slow, the loop forces the output, the perfect VCO, to track the imperfect reference. So it would reproduce its fluctuations exactly. Right? It's when like a, 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 a more capable person is being managed by a less competent person, right? So they have to follow their guide, right? So, so this is like a no noisy thing comes in and it falls. Now, beyond the loop bandwidth, the loop simply cannot track the poor behavior of the input. So it would gradually start getting better in frequency domain. If you look at it in a time domain versus in terms of timing jitter as opposed to the phase noise, what you will see that, again, for fluctuations that happen on time scales greater than the time constant of the loop, things will track. The loop will track the variations of the input. But when the time it happens on time constants that are shorter, the loop simply is not fast enough to force the output to track the input, and then you get, start getting the better behavior of the noiseless VCO. Right? So why did we do it this, this way? We looked at noise sources associated with VCO in one scenario and noise sources associated with the input in another scenario. Well, the reason is that the model that we had developed was a linear model. So if you do that, then you can basically have a superposition of these and see the overall behavior of these things. So there are different scenarios that actually arise from this thing and, and that, apply for different, that apply to different applications of the PLL. For example, the first set of application is a situation where you have a frequency synthesis. Right? When you have a clean reference and you're trying to force a, a VCO to be operating at either a different frequency or the same frequency and then track that good clean reference. Right? So now let's imagine that you have both noisy VCO and noisy reference. The only, the only the other assumption is that the input is less noisy than the VCO. So the VCO by itself has a higher phase noise than the PLL. So if you had the input only noise, you will get the black curve, if that was the only source of noise, right? which we derived from this, the previous. If you had the VCO only, you will get the blue curve. Now, and the overall output of the PLL will have a phase noise that will have a behavior like this. So at very low offset frequencies, very slow varying things, you get the phase noise of the reference, the input. And then you, at the very high frequencies, you get the phase noise of the VCO. And there's a transition like this for first order loop. It would be kind of become flat and all those things. And same thing with the jitter, timing jitter in time domain. Again, for the VCO only thing, you will get something that's flat like this. And then the blue curve, and then what you see for the, if you had the input, you will see the black curve. Or, uh, if the input was the only source of the noise, and if you had the combined, you will see that your timing jitter goes up, becomes flat, and, and this is what we call the PLL jitter. It, it, this is the parameter that people basically talk about, that when, at least they should be talking about when they talk about the jitter PLLs, uh, jitter of the PLL. Sometimes people measure it here, and they report the wrong numbers. Um, they need to measure it in that flat region. Um, okay. 
So this is the scenario number one, which basically we call the low fluctuation, low, low fluctuation input. It's a clean input, right? A frequency synthesizer is an example of that. Can you think of an, a practical example, which is the opposite of this that we mentioned earlier, one of the applications of the, VC, uh, the PLL? Clock recovery, right? Clock recovery is incredibly noisy at the input because the data is random, right? So you have a pretty high noise reference coming in, and you're trying to generate a clean clock off of that dirty um, input, right? So this is a high fluctuation input scenario. This is the opposite. Now, the input behavior is stronger than the, the VCO. So what happens is that you're trying to use the VCO to clean that input. So now it's the same scenario of those, those two curves. The two curves, the black curve and blue curve, look the same. They have just like shifted with respect to each other. One has become larger, the other one was smaller. And what you see is that now within the loop bandwidth, you are trying to, you, what you will follow that, you will gen, regenerate the uh, dirty, the fluctuation, the time, timing variations of the input, which is due to the data in this case, right? Now, but outside the loop bandwidth, you will get the lower phase noise of the VCO. And similarly, you can see that the timing jitter at low time scales would be smaller and a longer time scale would be larger. So now the question is the following. If you are making a PLL at, for a synthesizer, for a frequency synthesizer, would you make the bandwidth, the loop bandwidth, which is a design parameter of, in your control, larger or smaller? So first scenario, you're talking about the low fluctuation, low fluctuation input. In that scenario, would, to get the minimum amount of noise at the output, minimum amount of timing inaccuracy. Would you like to have a large omega loop or small omega loop? Well, well, think about it. You want the loop to track, the, the, the clear thing is the input, right? So you want, it to, you want the output to track the input as closely as possible over as broad a range of frequency as possible. So you want to put your omega loop higher so the actual, the height of this VC, VCO curve, if, instead of happening there, it would happen at the lower level. If I put it, for example, at the higher frequency, the flat region would be lower. Right? So I want to make the bandwidth larger for a synthesizer loop bandwidth, right? The, the larger bandwidth, because that would allow it to cl as closely as possible over a broader range of frequency to track the cleaner input. Now, and in the case of, now the opposite situ situation happens in the case of a clock data recovery. You don't want a very large bandwidth because you don't want, you want this to suppress these as soon as possible. So you want to push the omega, uh, omega loop down so that the input fluctuations are suppressed as soon as possible and you switch to the VCO fluctuations as soon as possible. Now, the other thing is that we've talked about the divider noise, right? We said that the dividers also, so if you have a frequency divider in your loop, the, the dividers can also have a noise source at the output added. And the divider noise at the output is just, can be added as an additive noise source, can be modeled as an additive noise source as shown here in purple. Now, if you look at this, the additive noise source is also at the input of the phase detector where the phase comparison is happening. So since it's noise and its polarity doesn't matter, you, instead of applying it here, you can actually apply it here. Right? So it wouldn't matter if you apply it to this input or that input. And when you do that, what you will see is that the actual divider output noise behaves similar as the input reference noise. Right? It has the same behavior as far as the loop is concerned. So it can actually push things up the same way. So now if you put all of these together, if you combine all of these, you can actually come up with an aggregate model that describes the general behavior of a PLL. So think about it. So let's say you have a PLL with a frequency division, let's say frequency synthesizer. Then you have a reference noise that's shown as like the black curve. Now also imagine that you have a, a VCO that has the shape of this like red, the tail part of the sled curve. So, so they have the VCO that's going like that. Now, if the, and you can have a zero and two poles in the response of the, the PLL. So you have this thing, uh, the, re the reference noise is shifted up by 20 log of n, right? And if you have a higher order loop, instead of this becoming flat, the blue curve, you get the black blue curve, for example, the second order loop, not only reduces it, but also makes it lower at lower input frequencies because it's a higher order loop, it can suppress it more. So when you combine these things, 
you get actually this overall red curve. Now, one of the things that's notice, noticeable is that initially, if you combine them, you would expect to see something that looks like that like dashed green curve, right? If you combine the green and the black shifted up by 20 log n. Now, but if you have your divider, and this is something that typically happens, if you have a divider that has noise, you remember that also acts as the input drop noise. So your effective input noise is not really that black curve, but it's rather that flat purple curve combined with the black curve. And that's what gets shifted up by 20 log of n. And that's why you don't get this as deep a drop here in, many, in some scenarios. And you basically get to a region that's flat, and then you peak a little bit, and you go down. So if you look at the phase noise, of a PLL, a synthesized PLL, you will see this thing on a log log plot, which would appear like they're this like Lorentzian shape in a linear plot on a spectrum analyzer. So you can see that by combining these different elements and looking at them one at a time and using this linearized model, you can actually kind of gain a lot of insight about how the PLL behaves. And again, this is a very introductory uh, kind of like um, exposure to a very detailed subject. There's a lot more nuance involved in this. But that at least should give you a little bit of a sense of how the noise gets evolved in a PLL. All right? Any questions? <laughs>